All you who believe, all you who have faith, be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be precautious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he has the right to be be mindful of and precautious of. And do not go to your graves, do not die, except in a state of Islam, in a state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not about to proceed. So inshallah today, uh, with the help and the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'd like to spend the few minutes that we have here today that Allah has blessed us, that guide, Allah ta'ala has guided us here to his house to fulfill the obligation that he has put on our necks in the Quran in performing the Salat of Jummah and listening to the khutbah. I'd like to bismillah continue with what we started last time uh, in reflecting on the Surah Al-Baqarah. To start out with, let's, uh, inshallah, uh, bring to mind some of the points that we talked about last time. We mentioned that Al-Fatiha is a summary and essence of the Qur'an. And Allah Ta'ala then placed a surah after, um, after Al-Fatiha, the first surah that was uh, revealed in its entirety in Medina, Al-Baqarah, the longest surah in the Qur'an, a surah that has 286 ayat or verses in it, Allah Ta'ala is now giving us the detail of that essence that Al-Fatiha represents. As, as recall that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that Al-Fatiha is the Umm Al-Qur'an, or the essence of the Qur'an, the summary of the Qur'an, the essence of Islam. So now we're now getting the details of that essence, of that summary. And Al-Fatiha, as I mentioned, is uh, the longest uh, surah in the Quran. Uh, if you're following the and reading from the font that has the Farsi slash Urdu font, you'll find that this surah contains over 40 ruku. And if you're reading the Uthmani font, then it would have just under six hizb, uh, the Qur'an containing 60 hizb, so each hizb has uh, four quarters. And so therefore, it would take in Ramadan, uh, the Imams that usually lead the Salah, they, the, uh, in eight rakah, they read from the, mainly from the Uthmani font. It would take them then, uh, if you read eight rakah per night, what, a little un under uh, two nights, or a little over two nights with regards to completing this ruku. I mean, excuse me, the surah. So again, 40 ruku, or uh, just under 6 hizb, as far as the duration of it. Uh, the period we mentioned is th that this surah was revealed when Rasulullah made the hijrah all the way to right before the Battle of Badr, approximately 16 to 17 months. And also, uh, this surah, so, so that was when, when most of the surah was revealed. But there was a few sections of it that was revealed right before the death of Rasulullah sallallahu Namely, the ayat that deal with the prohibition of riba, and also uh, the 281st uh, ayah in this surah, uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentioned that fear the day that you will be brought back forth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then you will be paid back. Uh, every soul will be paid back with regards to what they had earned. This was the last ayah 281 that was revealed uh, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, about 80 days before he passed away. So this is what uh, tells us with regards to the, the context of the surah. The importance and the virtue of it, again Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that everything has a hump, everything has a high point, a zenith point, and the hump or the zenith point, the highest point in the Quran is Surah Al-Baqarah. And uh, we talked about then the huruf al muqatta'at the cut up letters that this surah starts out with, alif, lam, mim. And we talked about how uh, most of the scholars in general, the scholars mentioned that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the meaning of, the, uh, of these huruf al muqatta'at these cut up letters, but that uh, the scholars comment that the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it right at the beginning of Al-Baqarah, and then after this, 
ayah Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala said ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين so Allah says alif lam mim ذلك الكتاب that is the book لا ريب فيه there's no doubt in it هدى للمتقين it is a guidance for those who have a taqwa so it's an answer to the last part of al-fatiha where we're seeking hidayah uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're, we're, we're declaring every time in al-fatiha is saying, ihdina surat al-mustaqeem. Uh, but as it relates to alif lamim, the scholars mentioned that before Allah tells us that this book is a book of hidayah, Allah ta'ala tells us something that we cannot understand. In other words, it's teaching us the principle that if you want to truly benefit from this book, that the reader truly benefit from this book, then you should approach this book with humbleness, with sincerity, with a heart to seek the truth. And then this book will be your guidance. So if you come with the, with the thinking and the thought that my mind and my intelligence, I know everything, and to come with arrogance and to come with pride, this book is not for you in that sense. This book is for those people who humble themselves accept everything uh, about this book. And uh, as I mentioned last time, uh, I was listening to a debate uh, or a dialogue between uh, a Muslim scholar and an atheist guy. They were talking about the Quran being the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you hear that the word of that atheist when he was debating this Muslim scholar, the realization of this point that the scholars make comes, comes to, uh, to you. He said, when he was debating him, just arrogantly, pridefully, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. I mean, even without the, even the correct makhraj and pronunciation, he's like, so what is this? What is it? How can these be the words of God? How, how can you claim? So the guy, you know, it's like, from, from a point of view, a view of ignorance and a pr- point of view of arrogance and pride, he comes in and just recites a couple of verses and says, this can't be from God. I mean, just a blanket statement like that. So again, this alif la mim at the beginning is the point for the believers is that come to this book with humbleness and sincerity and a truth seeker. And inshallah, it will be hudal lil muttaqin. It will be a guidance then for you, the people who have taqwa. Uh, the, the point also with regards to la raibati, that there is no doubt in this book. This tells us uh, that, subhanAllah, the la coupled with the ba here, la rayba. This is telling us, the scholars say in classical Arabic, tells us that there is absolutely no ounce or space or minute particle of doubt that this book there's no doubt in it. So, the, the, you know, subhanAllah, we can, you know, if you look at the sayings of the scholars, there's been volumes and volumes that, that have been written with regards to this point, that the Quran is indeed the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a few points then to consider with regards to this is that, uh, is that first of all, this is a very bold statement. لا ريب فيه. There is no doubt in this book. This is a very bold statement. I mean, if someone were to approach with regards to trying to identify the author of, of this book, the Quran, how, what do you find with regards to human authors? Go and open any book. You open the, the preface of the book or the introduction of the book, the author says something like, this is a humble effort. And I'd like to thank such and such and such a person. And if I've made any mistakes on this subject, then please write to such and such a, a place. You know? Human scholars, human authors, they start out their books like this. But the Quran starts out with something opposite. You know? La rayba fi. There is no there is no ounce, there's no doubt that this there's no doubt in this book. So this tells you that this is not a humanistic quality. The author of this book cannot be a human. A human being cannot make a claim like this. You know, to use a, a modern day example, it would be like uh, 
uh, Brother Iman finishing his uh, PhD or, or master's in school, a dissertion he writes. And then his, in his dissertion, he puts a label on top of his dissertion and says, this dissertion is perfect. There is no doubt in this dissertion. There's no mistake in it. I dare you to find any mistakes in it. And he hands that into his professor. What do you think his professor is going to do? His professor is going to go crazy trying to find a mistake in that dissertion. So you would never find a human being making such a bold, such a, such a powerful statement that there is no book, there is no doubt in this book. And with regards to uh, the points, of, of, of that doubtfulness, that there's no doubt in what? There's no doubt with regards to the historical facts in the Qur'an. There's no doubt with regards to the statistical facts of the Qur'an, that mathematical, geological, embryological, in general scientific facts in the Qur'an. There's no doubt with regards to the prophecies, the sayings that the Qur'an said before they came true. You know, and the biggest, the biggest, aspect of the miracle of the Qur'an is its linguistic it's a ling linguistic miracle the level of the, of the Qur'an you know subhanAllah the, the uh, contemporaries of Rasulullah one of the means that they, they accepted, one of the main means that they accepted the Qur'an was it's just pure power and it's, it's language it's balance, it's rhythm its conciseness, its preciseness. People were overwhelmed to where, you know, obviously the doubters and the mushrikeen, the kuffari, used to start saying, well, this is magic and this is poetry and all these excuses that they used to come up with with regards to the Qur'an. So, so as a believer, pick subhanAllah, pick then the, the, the aspects of the Qur'an that, that layer upon layer put the Iman and still us in the Iman that this book is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for a disbeliever and a, and a doubter of the Quran, pick your poison as they speak. What, what, do you want to, what do you want to pick? What do you want to pick with regards to doubting the Quran? No one has been able to find any mistakes, any doubt in, in this book. Anyone who sincerely and truthfully approaches this book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It is a guidance for them. Uh, and then we talked about the levels of taqwa, uh, that again, this book is for those people who are precautious. Those people who take cautiousness and are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at taqwa, we briefly talked about, like if you're going on a trip, you know, the scholars, they use analogy, you know, uh, if you're going on a trip, you're going to, you know, make, make your luggage, you're going to take your bag, you're going to pack your clothes, you're going to pack your toothpaste, you're going to, what are you doing? You're being precautious, you're being cautious of, so you don't get stranded or you're, you're on your trip, you're not left with something that subhanAllah is going to, uh, you know, mess up your trip. So a taqwa is the same way. Uh, people who have a taqwa, they're always conscious and precautious with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything the scholars say in their lives rotate about one question. What I'm about to do, what I'm about to say, what I'm about to think, what I'm about to act, is this going to earn the pleasure or the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Their whole lives rotate around this central question. Um, and then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْرِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ that this book, it is for those who believe in the ghayb and وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ And they establish the salah. And uh, we talked about briefly that the ghayb, you know, this signifies the realities of the hidden world. I mean, none of us, none of us have seen Allah subhanahu None of us have seen Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. None of us have, have seen the angels or what have you, so on and so forth. But these people of taqwa, they are convinced of this belief, the akan al-iman, believing in Allah subhanahu wa taala, believing 
and the angels and the books and the prophets, the day of judgment and the qadr, the good and the bad thereof, they are convinced about this. And this conviction in the ghaib leads these people right away to the action. And the first action that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions is الصلاح, they establish the salah. So belief in Islam again is not just hearsay. It's not just a, a slogan. It's not just lip service. It's proving it with actions. And the number one proof here quantified in Al-Baqarah is to establish the salah. And we talked about how uh, how to establish the salah. And to establish the salah, one of the means of it is to be a protector of the salah, to protect the salah, and to be a guardian of it. Like we talked about the, the when you go to uh, the museum and they have a very precious jewel, they have a very precious thing that they're, artifact that they're, that they are, um, Protecting, what do they do? They put it in a big room, they put lights around it, they focus the lights in on it, and they have guards, and they have security systems, and they have infrared uh, technology, and what have you, to what? To guard that precious thing. So the salah, one of the means of establishing it, is to be a guardian of it, to think about it. Ah, salat al dhuhr is coming. Let me prepare for it. Let me make sure I have wudu. Let me, uh, let me make sure ex externally my clothes are clean. The place that I'm going to pray is adequate for it. The, it doesn't have too much disruptions. At home, we, we establish together as a family, if we're not able to come to the masjid, we have the son or the father give the adhan. They call the aqama. The whole family takes a break from whatever they're doing, and they come and they stand and they establish the salah and they make a big deal out of it. They make it an event the five most important events in their lives. Not just simply taking a break from our routine, oh, I'm busy in this meeting, or I'm busy doing this and that, let me jump on my sajada, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, I'm going to quickly, Salaam Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah, Salaam Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah, then go jump back in whatever I'm doing. The scholars mention, make it an event, make it a central aspect of your life, five times a day. And so, this is fulfilling then what? The first, uh, the duty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has upon us. But Allah ta'ala didn't stop there. He didn't say that just establish the salah. What is the next thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then uh, tells us that وَمِمَّا رَزَقُنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ After that, these believers who have taqwa, who establish the salah, they give out of the risk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given for them. So, so that believe in the unseen first leads us to fulfilling the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also fulfilling the rights that other human beings have upon us and that the world has upon us. So Islam doesn't tell us to become a monk and to just divorce ourselves from the world and go into the mountains and say that is righteousness only. But right away, we fulfill our duties to our fellow men. And, and subhanAllah, we, we give out of the time, we give out of the money, out of the energy, out of the youthfulness, out of the health that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And we spend out of that, those amana, those trusts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has given us. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that says وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ And they are the ones who, these believers, they are the ones who believe in what has been sent down to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, And what has been sent down before you. In the Torah, in the Injil, and in the previous revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these believers who with a certainty, with a certainty believe in what was, was revealed to our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and these people of taqwa also believe in what was sent 
to, to, to the prophets that came before Rasulullah So they rise above nationality. They rise above regionalism. They rise above, above geography. They rise above races. You know, they, they, they don't say, well, that prophet was a different race or he was from a different region or what have you. They rise above all of that. And they say, whatever has been revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the previous revelations, we believe in it wholeheartedly and we don't make a distinction between the prophets either. And, and subhanAllah, one impact of this, especially in the charged environment that we are living in, the scholars mention is that sometimes, sometimes, we get a little emotional emotional with regards to the truthfulness of Islam. And when we talk to the Christians and the Jews, we should subhanAllah do it with regards to uh, respect and with regards to the best and the kind enlightenment. You know, we have this environment, this charged environment where in Abu Bada, some of them, they say, well, let's go ahead and have a ceremony of burning the Quran, Abu Bada, like they tried to do last summer, I believe it was. And we shouldn't be, as, as believers, reacting in an emotional, irrational way and say, well, your Bible is just full of mistakes and just be ir irrespective to them. Yes, the scholars say we should condemn that. We should stand up and say we do not stand for that, for you to burn our holy book. But at the same time, that doesn't give us a blank check to go ahead and start abusing the Bible or the Torah or whatever, what have you. Recall what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us whenever we invite to the deen. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nahr, Ayah 125, Which translates to mean that you shall invite, you shall invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom. With, with the best of words and kind enlightenment and debate or dialogue with them in the better manner. Truly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your Lord knows best which one of them or who has gone uh, astray from his path and he knows best and he is best aware of those people who are guided. Barakallahu lana wa lakum fil Quran azim wa nafa'ana wa yaakum bil ayati wa bil hakim innahu ta'ala let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Astaghfirullah. In Allah, Malaika, who is a loon, Alan Nabi, Ya, you had Ladina Amanu, Sadu Alehi was a limo to Sina. Allah Masari Alam Mohammed Pilawani, Allah Masari Alam Mohammed Pilahirin, Allah Mabarak Alam Mohammed Pilawalin, Allah Mabarak Alam Mohammed Pilahirin, Washadwala Ilahilullah, Washadwana Mohammed and Abduhu or Sul. I'm about to proceed. So, inshallah, very quickly, the fourth ayah, and then inshallah, we'll stop for, the, for today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, so this yaqeen, with regards, uh, the translation of this is with regards to the hereafter, they have a yaqeen, they have a firm, unwavering, unflinching belief. So with regards to the hereafter, the believers are certain, and they have a conviction, and they have no doubt that uh, it will occur. And at the end of the day, the people of taqwa, who establish the salah, who give in, uh, out of the risk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for them, these are the people who are truly, truly convinced with regards to the day of judgment. In other words, when we truly become convinced about the akhirah, the fruits of it, 
is that we will be, inshallah, of the people who are of taqwa, who establish our salah, and our, and our guardians of our salah, who, who, who fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we give out of the risk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. This is, this is the, the central point here. And uh, I'll close with this saying of Hazrat Aisha anha, that kind of gives us a perspective with regards to the importance of this. Aisha anha, said uh, that if the first matter revealed in the Quran was with regards to not the prohibition of drinking alcohol, if this was the first matter that Allah Ta'ala has revealed, the people would have said, we will never follow that. And then she said, if the first matter that was revealed in the Quran was with regards to the prohibition of adultery and fornication, the people would have said, we will never follow that. But then Aisha says that the, but the first matters that were revealed in the Quran were not about those things, but rather it was with regards to heaven and hell and the day of judgment until the people's hearts, they were attached to that. And what is heaven and hell and the day of judgment? That's the akhirah. Until the people's hearts were attached to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed and then the orders of halal and haram came through. So Aisha Ritalanha is telling us here as a further explanation of this that these people are thoroughly have yaqeen and they are firmly convinced about the akhirah is that when we are convinced about that day that we're going to be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's going to be malik yawm and we can when we think about that every time when we recite that in the salah at least 17 times a day we do that and and we we are hopeful about the success of going to Jannah, and we are fearful about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then and only then will everything else fall into place, and we'll get our priorities straight, and the society will get the priorities straight, and the whole world will, subhanAllah, will be with regards to what Allah ta'ala uh, will, will, will function in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this life, and that is to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is that we are tested on this earth and we will be given and will be raised back up on the day of judgment and given our test results, test results. We'll end with that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open my heart and your heart to the nur and the guidance of the Quran and let us make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. Rabbana la tu'akhidna in nasina wa ta'ana. ربنا ولا تحمل علينا اسم كما حملته للذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به وعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا للقوم الكافرين آمين. اللهم إني نعوذ بك من عذاب القبر ومن عذاب جهنم ومن فتنة المحي وممات ومن فتنة الشر مسيح دجال عباد الله إن الله يعمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاد القرباء ومهان الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لألكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله تعالى وأولى وأرسو وجل وتم وهم وأكبر وأقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح فقام الصلاة فقام الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إذن الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفر إنه كان توابا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سمي الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله What we have is not from us, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
that opportunity to come to the masjid, we have opportunity to practice what we learn. We can have education, we can have intelligence, but if we don't use it, it's useless. The opportunity right now to donate to the masjid, to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower you with your great mercy and